All right, welcome in hockey fans. It's Hockey Talk in the Desert Southwest, a cool 108 today or something like that, Andrew Bell. And uh, here we are talking ice cold hockey, college bar and grill here in Tempe, Arizona. First of all, I have two things to say. One, I have to apologize to you because last time you were here, the whole intro part didn't record. So we weren't able to add it to the show. It went live, which is great. Uh, but we need to talk about you a little bit more in this intro, so we bought you a little more time so we can talk about you and all the stuff that you're doing. Uh, yeah, so yeah, and no worries at all about the intro. I mean, <laughs> nobody wants to hear me anyway, so you don't talk about But uh, yeah, so right now I'm still over at House Sparky doing, um, doing managing editing. We're kind of a little bit of a downtime right now with the summer months, trying right. to just pick up and Well, there's no pieces. school here, right? Yeah, well, <laughs> no sports are going on. It's kind of our downtime. We're waiting for football season, volleyball, soccer, all the fall sports and winter sports to pick up. But um, yeah, so over at House Sparky, um, just helping out with what we can during the summertime. And then in addition to that, I'm over at Sports 360 AZ, which is ran by Brad Sesmet, um, who's a local kind of sports personality in town. And I've uh, been able to do a lot of coyote stuff with him, which has been really cool. Uh, he's got me, given me an opportunity to go down there and do some stories got to go down for prospect camp um, and yeah just working over there as well in addition to my duties house sparky so kind of dip in between the two of those and uh, kind of stand in the hockey scene here in town well for for those that don't know you and i met covering asu women's hockey yeah. we, we cover a little bit of everything you were there getting your first taste of uh, asu women's hockey a few years ago yeah all kinds of good stuff going on with the women's side of things and really big things going on with the arizona state sun devils ncaa team yeah, um, you know, it was really cool a couple years ago when I first started doing reporting stuff. Uh, my first job that I had was with um, the State Press, which is the on-campus newspaper here, and I got to cover the women's team. And uh, I think Lindsay Ellis, you know, is their head coach over there, is doing a really good job of just recruiting players and bringing them in. And I know you had Lindsay Fry on a couple weeks ago, and I was here too. And, um, they're just doing so much for hockey in the Valley and for women's um, hockey players. I mean, the numbers are just continuing to grow. And, uh, you know, it's really cool to see kind of that growth and development, um, not only between ASU, but at GCU as well with those schools. Then with the men's side of things, um, I mean, you just saw Demetrius Comont's East today, got selected to go to a national camp, has a chance to play in the World Juniors possibly, and um, just, you know, another great moment for the program, and, uh, you know, they're you know, working hard right now, and it's going to be interesting to see what they do this next year, obviously, Joey Decord. Um, out of the program now on to bigger and better things, but in net, and just kind of all around the ice, they have a great returning class with Comont East, Walker, pretty much everybody in back, just except for a few seniors. So um, they, you know, schedule came out, and I really like their schedule and their draw. Uh, it's kind of similar to last year's, but I'd say it even picks up more around the holiday time. They have a really rough stretch there in December, and uh, I think it's going to be, you know, a fun team to watch again just with how many returning guys they have. Absolutely. Well, you can probably hear in the background, folks, there's a baseball game going on. It's the All-Star game. Yeah. you got a little tie into baseball, too, don't you? With yeah. your little work over at the Diamondbacks and, and the stuff you do over there. But how exciting is that to have uh, an Arizona Diamondbacks starting an All-Star game again? Uh, yeah, so, yeah. And then another side thing that I do in addition to the sports agency, but I'm over um, just interning over at the Diamondbacks and helping out with their publications department, which kind of provides their uh, in-game magazine. I work with a magazine called D-Backs Insider. Yeah, it's really awesome. Cattell Marte has had such a, a great year and, uh, from both sides of the plate, too, both the left and the right side. He's been awesome. So, uh, yeah, working on the Diamondbacks is fun as well in addition to, you know, the hockey coverage that I'm able to you know, do out here. So it's really fun. Well, this, this afternoon, earlier today, I had a chance to sit down with Coach Powers for three segments that are going to be coming up on our podcast over the next three weeks as we prepare them for a trip to China, which I didn't think I'd ever be saying. I mean, I think you and I, when we're sitting together three years ago at, at in Oceanside Ice Arena, we weren't going like, hey, I bet in three years the team's going to China. Yeah, it's crazy. Um, I, you know, with that trip to China, it's going to be, I imagine, for a lot of those guys who probably haven't ever been to China, it's going to be a great experience for them. Um, and then just seeing the game try and develop over there, I'm going to be interested to see, kind of, kind of see and hear about, uh, you know, the teams they play and what the competition's like and how much the game is developing over in a country like China. But like I said, it's probably going to be a great cultural experience. And um, like I said, when those guys get back, I'm sure they'll have a lot of stories to tell us about the trip and what they're well, getting a chance to do. Coach Powers told me today that, that you know, hockey is a vehicle that's getting them over there. That's why they're going over there. But it's really the cultural experience that he's looking at bringing. He's going, I'm guessing that 95% of my team would never be in this country if it wasn't for this hockey trip. So it's a chance for them to get to feel 
something different. Here's the big kicker, though. Coach Powers was really excited about giving a chance to see his team on the ice in yeah. July and August when everybody else is going like, hey, you can't touch their teams, right? So yeah. this is something the teams can do once every four years. Sun Devils had the opportunity to do it right now. They jumped on it. It's a great way to continue the growth in their program. I talked to him a little bit about goaltenders, what he's going to do, everybody's going to play, right? Mm -hmm. We talked a little bit about uh, Como, as we like to call him, who's going to be with the uh, Team USA uh, in their training camp this summer, so it looks very unlikely that Como will be going with them. But as Coach put it, we know where Como fits in our lineup, but we really don't need to see him. Yeah. So that's just a couple things coming up. Our special guest tonight is going to sit in with us for three segments. Is Leanne Blinn. She's a strength and conditioning coach with the Arizona State Sun Devil hockey team. She's also in charge of all of the Olympic sports at ASU. You and I have both met her. We both visited with her. I did a little story with her uh, a year ago. Not even that, about half a year ago. And uh, I think it's really neat to talk about what hockey players do in the summertime, right? And now we're talking about almost a split season, right? They're going to prepare, they're going to travel, they're going to play games, then they're going to come back and get readjusted to America again, and then not start their real practice until September 1st or thereabouts. Yeah, and I think it's going to be really interesting. I know um, we were talking just before the show about that kind of that readjustment period of getting back into North America, being in different time zones. Um, and it's already tough enough as it is, you know, just to be a Division One athlete and try and stay up with, um, you know, how difficult that is between the different, whatever sport you're playing, um, you know, just how difficult that conditioning is and um, getting up to at peak performance um, and at your peak athleticism. But, yeah, it's going to be really interesting to see, you know, between the two time zones and kind of getting readjusted back to life after that trip. I think all in all, it's going to be, like I said, a great experience and um, probably learning a lot about your team and trips like those as well, just being on the road, being in a different country and just being with that group of people probably just going to help the camaraderie and just make a lot of chemistry going into the next season. Yeah, that was the other thing Coach Power told me today is it's really a nice team building experience, right? you got to live with these guys for 13 days yeah. and uh, you're going to get to know each other before they actually start an official season training camp. We talked a little bit also about the upcoming season, what that was going to be like. We talked about some of the guys last couple weeks ago we talked about the NHL development camps and the number of guys that went to that. A couple went to your hometown of San Jose, the Passionate Brothers and had a chance to uh, escape with San Jose. Coach Bowers told me today that the word he was getting back from Calgary, though, on Como or Demetrius Comanzis, was that Demetrius was the best player in their camp. I, you know, I would believe him. You know, he had such a breakout freshman season last year, and he got off as such a hot star, especially playing with Johnny Walker. They're so lethal on the power play. Um, but I think as he develops, I mean, he, would you, you know, I, Coach Powers mentioned this last year too, but what people fail to realize is he didn't play major junior hockey. I mean, he played high school hockey in yeah. Minnesota, and that's, you know, and, and joined the Sun so, Devils at age 18, right? Yeah, it's a true freshman. A lot of times you get guys in hockey who are in college hockey who are freshmen, but are 20, 21 years old. He's a true. He's a real true freshman, and um, I think he's just going to continue to develop over three years. And to see what he did just in the first couple of the month, first couple of months last season, uh, that says a lot about you know being able to produce and going up against grown men at the NCAA level at the age of 18 years old. And he's just going to get stronger. He's just going to get faster. He's already super quick. We've seen him with the puck, and he just brings a different um, dimension to that Asian team because he has so much speed and skill. And we talked about it at the beginning of last year, but last season, the last couple. Years, I don't really think, you know, in the beginning stage of this program, they really had, you know, a player who had that much speed and talent. He was um, just a huge asset last year, changed a lot of things for the culture of that program. And, you know, it doesn't really surprise me when you hear feedback like that out of a prospect camp. They hear a guy doing that well. Um, as for Princeton and Cena, I there in San Jose. It was funny. Uh, I was covering the Coyotes uh, prospect scrimmage for 4 360, and my sister texted me. She was over in, uh, she went to the prospect scrimmage and she said, Hey, right. a couple guys from Arizona State on the roster sheet. Did you ever cover them? And I said, yeah. And, you know, <laughs> I got a chance to cover their games and told, kind of told them what their game is like. Um, and so that had to be a really cool experience. So she had an eye out for them while she was at the prospect scrimmage and she was texting me updates like, oh, Brinson made a nice pass here, made, made a nice play there, turnover here, you know, just providing the updates. So, um, yeah, so 
all the guys, I saw Josh Maniscalco scored a goal um, in Boston Bruins development camp, and also Carson Vieira looked really good um, in yeah. Philadelphia. Talk about a lot of guys with speed and skill. Uh, seeing a couple of the videos I saw from different media outlets, he looked really good, and looks like a guy who can be an impact player right away when he steps on campus. Well, before we wrap up this segment and come back with our first special guest, Leanne Wynn, I got to tell you that, I don't know if you saw the Ottawa Senators release today, but Joey Decord was actually number nine of our, <laughs> he's not a Sun Devil anymore, but Joey was mic'd up for their three-on-three -three scrimmage. Three minutes and 50 seconds of Joey Decord. I said, who knew Joey, Joey could talk, right? And Joe, well, Joey had some good stories last year, and I'm sure that'll be an interesting segment, especially with him goaltending. The one thing I always used to think about Joey Decord was he's such a good puck handler behind the net. Right. He's probably talking with the defenseman a lot, so I'm sure that'll be a cool mic up segment. I didn't get a chance to check that out yet, but I'm going to have to. When you hear it, look for one line in there where he says, Oh, God, I'm tired. <laughs> you didn't hear that too often from him last year. He's a workhorse. <laughs> yeah. All right, we're going to come right back with our special guest, Leanne Blinn, in just a minute. Welcome back in hockey fans, 108 degrees here in the desert southwest, Andrew Bell is with me, our special guest Leanne Blinn is with me from Arizona State University on her second stint. Second stint, right? yep. Alright, so let's get these titles right. Head of Olympic sports, yep. right? And then also the strength and conditioning coach for Sun Devil Hockey. Sun Devil Hockey, yep, absolutely. All right, you and, and I met, sports too. You and I met last year, right? Correct. I was impressed when I met you about how this team maintained itself, right? How we got about halfway into the season and I said, How are you guys not getting injured, right? How can we not lose the spot? They gave all the credit to you. I gave them the tools to do it and they did it. So all right. I won't take all, right. all the credit. Um, but you know, they followed a plan and I individualized a lot of things for guys and you know, they luckily knock on wood they did stay pretty healthy and um, you know, it's a test to them. They bought into everything that I brought to the table for them. They individualized a lot of stuff for them and for each of the guys and you know, you can't you can't train everyone the same, even though they're all hockey players. They all have little you know, like Dax last year had you yeah. know, his little things and, and every every guy has their own little intricacies that they have to deal with and past injuries and stuff so we did a ton of individualization with them and worked well with CJ who's our athletic trainer yeah. you know saying hey what can we do can't we do if I have to back off from a you know strength session and do more mobility because guys are just a little bit more banged up than usual that's what we did so um, we do a lot of what I call OTS which is off the script um, so you can have the, this well-rounded plan for the whole year all laid out and then something kind of happens and you just have to go off the script for the whole team or individuals and that's, it. that's how we roll as strength coaches. So. Alright, so I told you we're going to start the first segment out but we're going to review your career because I don't think you get enough credit for, your, for what you've done in your past <laughs> and your second stint, like I said, here at ASU. So tell us a little about you, where you grew up, what you did. All the things you've accomplished, the medals you wore on your neck, the titles that you hold or held. Ooh, we got a lot longer than that. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, I've been doing this a long time. So, um, for me, I started, I grew up in Southwood, Massachusetts, uh, way out in um, Western Mass, right. um, outside of Springfield. Um, I played field hockey and softball throughout my whole career um, in high school and in college at Endicott College. I li started lifting weights when, you know, the whole universal there wasn't really anything in the, in the gym at the in at the high school um it was like one little universal machine you know with a leg press and all that and um you know got involved with you know with just training for sports performance in terms of hey i want to become a better field hockey player i want to become a better softball player i skied in the winter so i just kind of started reading and you read muscle and fiction i call it muscle and fiction muscle and fitness and you start learning things because back then it wasn't really a big huge thing for sports performance or strength conditioning um, besides maybe football, you know, when the head football coach ran strength conditioning, um, you know, for the guys. Um, and I just kind of got involved in the gym. And then uh, from there, um, I went to school for athletic training. I went to Endicott College um, and played field hockey and softball there. So I was an athletic training major, dual sport athlete, D3 school. So I had a lot going on. I'd get up at 4 o'clock in the morning and go work out. So I was a little bit psycho and crazy back then, as I still am now. Um, <laughs> so, um, and the guys see it too, and all my athletes see it. Um, 
from there I went to Miami, Ohio, um, and I finished my undergrad there. Did not continue to play because it's D1 school. I was okay athlete, not a great athlete, but also being an athletic training major, you had to, that was your sports, you know, that was your time you had to spend and doing all that stuff. Um, when I went to, I kind of figured out that I didn't want to be an athletic trainer and got certified as an athletic trainer. Um, wanted to be a strength coach instead because I liked the weight room. Um, I did my first internship at Miami, Ohio with Dan Dalrymple, who is the strength coach and has been the strength coach at the New Orleans Saints for a long time. I give all my kudos to him to get me started and I loved it. Like I loved being in the weight room. I loved like pounding weights for myself but also seeing what it brought confidence levels to other athletes that I had a chance to work with. Um, from there, um, went to NAU, Northern Arizona University for my undergrad. Um, I did my first real competition there. Um, I met the my other GA, Trevor, and his wife, Michelle. They competed and they said, you know what, you'd really be good at competing at powerlifting and you should. So they took me to my first meet and I think I squatted like a measly 365 and benched a measly 200 pounds and deadlifted a measly 405 and that was it. And you know, I thought I was you know, I was psyched and everything, and um, it was my first meet. And um, Trevor would call me slow twitch because I tried weightlifting, snatch clean and jerk, and I did okay with it, but wasn't really my thing. Like, I competed probably three or four meets, and it just took too much time to learn a technique and being, you know, 22 years old competing in, in Olympic lifting. I was a little bit late, um, but I competed all the way through. Um, you know, since so 1997 was my first world meet, international world meet, went to Cape Town, South Africa. I came in sixth place out of seven, so the, my first first international meet was, you know, not the greatest, didn't do the greatest, but it was my first exposure to when the international. Beat somebody. I beat somebody. It was my first exposure to the international scene. Um, and then I just, my career kind of took precedence as strength conditioning. So I was at Nevada, Reno as a strength coach. Then I went to Boston College. When I was at Boston College, um, I met Charles Poliquin, and Art McDermott and Bruce Tessier who did a lot of strongman training. So I decided to you know what strongman as far as it fits into my schedule a little bit more. So I ended up competing, doing strongman from 2001 to 2003. Competed in ESPN's World Strongest Woman competition. Um, flipping tires, pulling planes. I actually just, uh, sent Johnny Walker a picture of me pulling the plane. He's like, uh, holy shit. Oh, sorry. <laughs> and, you know, he's like, yeah, I know. We're on. We're I know. on. Hey, so, five. Go right ahead. So, yeah, okay. Um, so he was a little bit shocked, you know, because I usually keep my, my stuff kind of to me, like, hey, this is what I do, and don't really express it as much, you know, because I don't want people to think, like, my job as a strength coach isn't necessarily what I'm going to make them do as my personal. So when I talk to people, oh, well, you power lift? You bench how much? You know, and they get kind of a little bit freaked out, the fact that you're going to turn me into them. But I went to school to be a strength coach, and I can separate the two of me being a strength coach and me being a competitive power lift and a strongman competitor. So, um, so it's been a fun ride. I got back into competing um, on the international scene in 2006, competed 2006 to 2017 um, for the U.S. women's team. Um, I hold or I've held 21 world records. Um, <laughs> That's and, the part that she <laughs> waits till the very end of what she's yeah, got. Yeah, so a lot of records. Yeah, it, it's been great. pretty awesome, both as an open competitor. So I'm 46 now, so and I still compete in the open category. I'm, I'm retired. I'm semi-retired, um, which I did last year um, after I did the World Games in 2000. 17 I, my goal was to podium finish the world games and I got a third place podium finished um, every every world championships every year I've ever done I've either I finished on the podium so I'm pretty proud of that um, first second and third I've got four world titles uh, bronze medal um, at the world games 2017 I was toying with the idea of coming back and making a comeback for 2021 world games We'll see. We'll see. I don't know. Um, it's a lot of work, a lot of time, and um, there's a lot of young, good athletes that are out there as far as, you know, I'm competing against 28-year-olds, and I'm, like I said, I'm 46, so um, it's a little bit. Let's see if my body holds up. Um, I just had surgery on my elbow and on my, um, on my shoulder to kind of clean it up. So rehab is going awesome. You know, Kyger is doing awesome. Um, you know, uh, Dr. Cummings did an unbelievable job fixing both. So um, almost back to I would say 90 percent. So there could be a, there could be a comeback on the table. We'll see if I can draw my husband out of retirement because I rely on my husband to help me a lot with my bench shirt and you know the little things the day to day. So. 
So it's gonna be really up to him whether he wants to come out of retirement to help me or you know, or if my body can really hold up on it. So so, I'm looking over there at Andrew so. and we're going and we're looking at each other going like we haven't done anything. <laughs> We've done absolutely nothing. I'm fifty seven, so, you're like what, twenty two? Yeah, twenty one. Yeah, almost twenty two. Almost twenty two? Yeah, 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 we haven't done a thing. Yeah. Dan, you got us whooped. So <laughs> I have I've been around for a while, you know. I've had to had had to push and had to do a lot of things and, and I can honestly say like being a female strength conditioning coach has been a hard, hard road traveled, but me being a strength conditioning athlete and being a competitive powerlifter, like, it helps bring, you know, just a lot of notoriety, not no, even notoriety, but just that, like, hey, she knows what she's doing, you know, yeah. and back when I first started, it was like, you're a female doing strength conditioning, you know, like, what, what are you doing? And, a little credibility, and it, right? it brings credibility to what, you know, what it is. Like, hey, I have a world record bench at, you know, or now American record bench at 424. Um, a girl that I compete against took it. Um, she's amazing, upcoming lifter. Well, not upcoming, she's world champion, but, um, you know, 424 bench and uh, 502 deadlift <laughs> and a 545 squat. So I'm not normal. I'm not normal. <laughs> you throw <laughs> so, these numbers around like it's like nothing, yeah, right? Yeah, just throw it around like it's normal. I'm not normal, but. Uh, All right. So that's almost a full segment. Okay. I figured it would be. I wanted you to tell your story. Yeah. I appreciate that part of it. <laughs> um, we're going to come back in a minute and we're going to talk a little bit about how you condition hockey players. Yep. Andrew's got a bunch of questions on that. I know he does. Yep. And um, we're going to ask you how you intertwine with the uh, Arizona State Sun Devil hockey team together. I mean, how do these guys react to you? Why hockey of all the sports? And uh, go from there. Huh? All right, we'll be right back in just Thanks, a minute. Sir. Hockey fans here in the desert southwest. It hasn't gotten any cooler. We're back at segment number three. Leanne Wynn is still with us. I told her she had to stay around for a couple of segments. So uh, we've got her here. Andrew, questions? Yeah, so talking about the ASU hockey team, obviously, you're nice on hockey. And so, Leanne, I just want to ask you a few questions kind sure. of about the Sun of a hockey team. Obviously, a great season this last year, and um, they had a ton of success, make the NCAA tournament first time, but for conditioning hockey players, how does that kind of differ from maybe other sports that you've dealt with that are kind of various sports? I think you got to look at the sport as an individual. Um, you know, you take hockey, you know, you look at their shift, you break it down, you know, it's maybe they're on the ice for six seconds and they get double shifted, you know, um, but for the most time you're, you know, your goalie's out there the whole game, but, you know, action, whether it's on their end, you know, or not, um, but we try to break down the conditioning to... They need a little bit of an aerobic base, but not like a soccer player where a soccer player runs nine and ten miles. Hockey player not even close. And, and in all reality, you can do all the conditioning outside, on the track, on the turf, um, in, in any surface on the ground. It's not fully going to transfer over to them skating. You know, they're always going to get sore. They're always going to. It's a different motion than running. Um, and most, most of the time, you take hockey players off the ice and you teach, you have them go run, and it's like arms go side to side and flailing and, and all that. So it's a little bit different. Um, but the conditioning side of things, you know, I look at energy system training as opposed to, you know, hey, looking at it from a sport specific standpoint because sport specific is really a garbage term I think people use to say, you know, hey, buy this, you know, hockey book or soccer book or this, you know, and there's some things, there's some truth to it, but I think that you have to look at the sport as a whole and not just the actual sport. You got to look at the athlete in terms of, hey, what what's the athlete good at? Some some have a great, you know, fast twitch muscle fiber and they can explode and they recover, it takes them a little longer to recover um, or, you know, slow oxidative, you know, like slow twitch muscle fiber. We have a mix of those guys on our team. So, and so we talk about the need to just come on season. Yep. Of, this summer, the freshman class is fantastic this year for the ASU team. And um, from your perspective, when you have freshmen come into a program who have maybe not been on a daily um, kind of strength and conditioning program, coming into the visual program, what's that like? You're trying to get them kind of bought into that and that whole process? So it's different. Last year, all the guys came in for summer session two. 
So all your freshmen came in, summer session two, and you had four to six weeks to train for summer session to train with them and say, okay, this is what we're doing, get them used to our routine, the way things go, they get to go to class, they get to do a lot of different things. Then we teach them, hey, this is your you know, clean technique, squat technique, we get to do a lot of that stuff in teaching without having your upperclassmen around. Um, and they come in, you know, um, they're kind of voluntary as far as if they come in, most of the guys come in because they know how important it is. Um, so we had time. So last last summer, um, Garnet, the strength coach, then he had a lot of time to do with the guys. He didn't leave us until August when I took over, and then I took over in August um, to kind of give him that general prep period. Um, this year, however, is very different because, and I know we'll talk about it a little bit later, but these guys are going to come in. They report on the 18th, I think, have their or on the I don't know, whatever date it is. They report, and then they have their physicals the next day, and then they're on the ice the next day. So I have no time to get to know them in terms of, hey, what did you do? Um, you know, they check in with me a little bit. You know, hey, I send them a summer program. Say, hey, here's your summer program. Some of these guys and juniors haven't touched a weight. You know, I can think of a couple guys last year that they came in testing and the, you know, hey, body weight bench press for reps stapled with 180 on their chest. Like, okay, um, this is going to be a project. So this year we may have a little bit of the same, but I think there's the high expectations that are there because they had such a great year last year. I think all the freshmen and incoming rookies are like, you know what, I have to work during the summer. And um, I've been in contact with them saying, hey, this is, you know, just if you have questions on the summer program, I send them all summer programs, all summer packets. Some, some guys work out with their strength coaches at home or do the programs which I'm fine with because their guys have their eyes on them every day. You know, here, our guys that are here, I have eyes on them, but I can't technically coach them because it's all voluntary. But I know, like, hey, I can go coach them and say, hey, this is wrong, but they're doing something wrong kind of thing, and I can run conditioning sessions for them. So um, this year is going to be a little bit different for those freshmen coming in. It's going to be kind of like a what just slapped me and hit me in the face kind of thing. <laughs> and for those freshmen last year who you mentioned kind of had, yep. um, you know, I don't want to mention any names, obviously, but the guys yep. coming in with a little bit of struggles. Um, how did you see them progress over the course of the year and kind of as they got into their daily routine or maybe their weekly routine of a divisional it's, team? It was unbelievable the difference in, in all of them in terms of what they – you know, it, it's different. I think sometimes, even with guys and hockey players, you come in, you're older than like football players. And I used to say when I worked in football, like they used to come in looking like boys and leaving looking like men. Some of the hot guys now, they come in looking like men and they just look, they, they leave looking like a grown up version of, of, of a man, you know, kind of thing. So it's a little bit different. Um, you know, but our guys did unbelievable. Our freshmen embraced the weight room, just like the upperclassmen. And I think. I think they had such a tight-knit bond, the whole team, and I think that's why they did so well the whole year. Like, the coaching staff, Coach Powers is unbelievable. The whole coaching staff is unbelievable, and they get it. They understand it, and, you know, I'll do anything for those, for that, those kids in that program in terms of, hey, like I said in the beginning, if I need to modify things because someone has a shoulder issue, um, if I need to modify something because they have a back issue, an ankle issue, something's gone on, like, from my sports medicine background, even though I'm at CJ's the athletic trainer, I can look at somebody and say, okay, I can change this or add this um, so I think guys have just really bought into it really well um, and their bodies have changed significantly the guys the guys that I've seen I, like I can't wait to do their body fats and see where they're at because you know some of the guys that have stayed here now look unbelievable you know um, and even like Cliffy uh, he's you know right he, he stayed around he stayed around he looks unbelievable like he's trained with us all summer long he trained the summer all you know like hey I'm not done yet you know right. pro like those guys like but it, it's unbelievable. Like to me, one of the best compliments you can get is guys that are done, but they want to stick around and they want to train yeah. because of how they felt. And, and they ask for programs to, you know, hey, I know I'm done. Um, you know, can I have an alumni lift? You know, and it's like, hey, you know, here you go. And they want to stay in shape and they want to train. So it's pretty awesome. So tell me a little bit about. We talked about these young guys coming in, right? Yeah. And they're not really. And, and then over the summer, you have somebody that maybe puts on 15 or 20 pounds of muscle. Yeah. What does that make you feel like? It's pretty awesome. As yeah. long as it's usable and functional, then I'm happy. If it's if they've been out eating too much pizza or junk or you know of age and doing too much okay. drinking, then it's I not. I said hockey player, not me, right? Okay. So, so when you see me in season, in season, and, season, and you yeah. go like, "Hey, how many pizzas yeah, have you had?" Right? Yeah. Or, yeah. <laughs> um, 
so but it's it's pretty amazing you know like I said as long as their their strength gains and their you know if they're gaining weight their body you know as long as their body warms it and they can hold it and as long as their speed doesn't slow down I'm okay with them putting on weight you know I'm okay with them eating carbs I'm okay with them they have to refuel their body so you know we test their body fat we use the in body um, you know their sports nutrition department um, and we test them out and make sure they're staying up there you know as far as their lean muscle mass is, is up and they're not gaining too much fat mass sometimes guys that don't play a lot it's like hey at training table I'm gonna eat whatever I want it's like you're not burning as many calories unfortunately so so we try to monitor you know a little bit you know I'm never gonna say no to what guys are eating but hey higher protein level and make sure you're replenishing eating the post game carbs and things like that so and guys have taken it really serious their nutrition they've all been spot on with their nutrition and um, it, it's been like I said I'm excited to see you know what body fats come back as not that it's the sole indicator of how they're going to play but you know if you look at nhl players nhl player the average nhl player is nine percent nine ten percent so you know the the less non-usable mass that you're carrying around the easier it's going to be for you to skate play recover so um you know so muscle mass is important the muscle mass is important for them and so you mentioned uh coach powers as well and uh, just your interaction with them what has that interaction been like just with the staff and kind of on a daily basis over the course of the COVID season um they've they've honestly been awesome like when i first when x um Coach, when Garnet X to be, when he yeah. said he's, you know, gonna go, you know, move on and do other things, I went to Coach Powers and I said, look, I said, I, I, I'm more than happy. I'd love to take over the guys if you want me to. I said, or I will find you the best hockey. You know, if you want someone that has the expertise that played in the NHL, I said, I will find you that best. And he's like, nope, they're all yours. And um, and it was, uh, and I was really, you know, grateful for that opportunity to take these guys. I've had the opportunity to work with hockey in the past. Um, when I was at Boston College many years ago, I had women's hockey. I helped out with. Um, um, with men talk, talking on the side, I, when I owned my business, um, I had a lot of club, uh, pro, uh, junior teams and things like that, and I had a couple guys go on and play, and so I had experience ho- hockey with high school teams and everything, so it was, you know, I, I was very grateful for the opportunity. My husband, husband lo- loves hockey, so so he was very happy, um, he so he, lo- he loves that part. Um, <laughs> Yeah, and the New York Rangers are his favorite team, so I... Yeah. Shout <laughs> so, out to the Rangers. Yeah. All the Rangers yeah. Yeah. Um, okay, so I want to ask... Coyote, sorry. I, I, I want to ask you this in the, in the final minute of this segment. Um, last year, and Andrew can probably attest to two years ago with me, you probably didn't see a lot of them two yeah. years ago, but last year I was amazed at how healthy this team stayed. And I attributed it to two things. One, they were afraid to lose their spot in the lineup. Yep. And number two is, they all, when I asked them, they all, like I told you earlier, they all pointed to you as, you're doing the right things to keep them on the ice. Um, you know, and I, and like I said, I've told you before, like I'll never fully take credit. Like I gave them the tools and I looked at each, each individual athlete as an individual and said, all right, what do we need to fix? What do we need to work on? what do we need to do because you know everyone's a little bit of an individual and a little bit different in terms of hey you know if you're in season if they played you know we took 18 minutes if you played more than 18 minutes you're going to have two lift sessions that week but they're both going to be power based and if you didn't i got to keep your strength levels up and if you're someone like Zach, then i need to do mobility session maybe one maybe two mobility sessions with you instead of the strength session or one maybe conditioning session with you so i really looked at them you know how many minutes they played you know what. Um, you know what was ailing them, if anything, and uh, and I and I think they just we brought the weight room as a, as a good a place that they wanted to be, and they they felt stronger, and I think it gave them a lot of confidence, and I think that helped them, you know, on the ice as well. So, all right, we're gonna take a quick break. We're gonna come back. We're gonna talk about a special trip. We're gonna talk about how you condition hockey players for two seasons. We'll be right back. Hey, Michael here from M Drive. My dad, a world-class scientist, actually made M-Drive for himself to stay active and continue enjoying life. And yes, M-Drive supports healthy testosterone, but it's so much more. M-Drive is the everyday supplement to fuel your drive with more energy and more strength. Listen, we'd love for you to try M-Drive too. Visit mdriveformen.com and we'll give you 20% off your first purchase. Just type in the code DRIVE at checkout. Refind your prime with M-Drive. All right, welcome back in hockey fans to uh, College Bar and Grill here in beautiful Tempe, Arizona. And I look over my left shoulder, I can see Sun Devil Stadium. I know what's on the other side of Sun Devil Stadium. I know what's on the other side of Wells Fargo in the future, uh, just down the road. 
So, you know what? Leanne Glenn is here. She's got a home over there. Andrew, take it away. Yeah, so you talk about the facilities that's right across the street. Working with the guys at a tremendous facility. And just what's that like having you know, just talking about facilities here at ASU and kind of what Ray Anderson has provided and kind of some of the renovations? Yeah, it's been unbelievable. You know, see, see the difference when I was here on my first stint way back, you know, to everything that they've added, you know, to the football facility on the other side, to the expansion of the hockey arena that's coming, going to be coming, you know, with the excitement of putting a new weight room in there um, along with the, the hockey rink. And, but we do have great facilities, and, and I think administratively they did, they've done a phenomenal job. Like, I love like all of our administration. Ray Anderson's unbelievable. Um, you know, our weight room, you know, the boys call it the dungeon a little bit because there's not much sunlight <laughs> that comes into the, our weight room. Oh, that, to, that. They, yeah, call they, that they, the dungeon, they call right? that the dungeon. dungeon. Okay. Um, but it's spacious. We have a lot of space. We have a lot of platforms. We get we can get everything done that we need to get done. You know, we have great racks, tower lift racks, and things like that. So it's pretty it's pretty cool. Um, you know, we have another facility. So we have a lot of weight rooms here. Baseball has their own. You know, and on the other side we have um, Sun Devil Performance. So we have a weight room over there. So there's a lot of different facilities that we utilize for our student athletes and uh, like I said I'm excited when they build that hockey rink and put a weight room in there and you know I think it's going to be a showpiece a lot of these um, big college programs now like UMass is an unbelievable college weight room there like you know that's what they're going to you know it's, it's all about recruiting it's all about you know college hockey is, is growing significantly and uh, I think Sun Devil Hockey is you know on the map and I think it's only going to be even more on the map you know once they build that facility and you know and all that so all right, I'm going to piggyback on Andrew's comment about Ray Anderson. I talked to Coach Powers today for our series that's coming up over the next three Fridays on our podcast, College Hockey Southwest Weekly. And I asked him specifically, I said, you know, he just won a pretty prestigious award, the Frank Fisher Award for the Hold It On By His Peers, right? Yep. And he said, of all the awards that I would ever be eligible for, that's the one I wanted to win the most. And I thought, wow, that's, that's saying something, right? Any, you know, NCAA coach of the year, eh, not so much. I mean, he'd take it, yeah. but Frank Cush, he told me a little story. I'm not going to give it all away, but he told me a little story about Frank Cush. But what I grabbed from that little conversation of about two or three minutes was, he said, Ray Anderson doesn't look for anything else. He comes in going like, this is Premier. This, we're going to be Premier. And I'm yep. guessing you've heard that several times Absolutely. over again. Absolutely. like. He, athletes that come to Arizona State are going to be premier athletes, and there's no reason to look down on any sport. And that's why they're like, what, 19th overall in the country with all. And of that's why I came back here was that vision of wanting to, you know, hey, our Olympic sports are just as important as our as our other sports, and he's putting everything into that. So it's it's pretty awesome um, to have that vision because a lot of schools don't have that vision. So uh, kudos to him and. and what he, what he has envisioned for ASU and he's done a lot of phenomenal things and um, you know, being able to travel and, and right. things like that. You know. In addition to that comment too, I know what you're talking about kind of being a premier destination but the, it backs itself up between, you look at just the players this year, you have Keel Harry, Hunter Bishop, Brian Dort, and even yep. Marty Ice, Joey DeCord, all going professional. It's not, you know, we want to be premier, it's, it's kind of here, and it's still on its way with a lot of these athletes. But, um, yeah, I thought that was a good point as well, just talking about Ray Anderson, and kind of, you know, it's going to be top-notch facilities, top-notch everything, and kind of you mentioned the Olympic sports, I know. Um, last year, I had an interview with uh, Mr. Anderson, and that was one thing he emphasized, was the Olympic sports, we want every sport, it's all matters, same, but I don't think um, some athletic departments around the country really value that. I've been, been part of it, I've been part of it, and it's it's actually refreshing to hear, you know, like they do, the administration, they put a lot of time and effort into all their all their student athletes, and it's, it's pretty awesome. Um, you know, hockey, you know, the growth of hockey and what it's been, it's been really, really neat to see. All right, so you got a beautiful facility here on campus, yep. but here in about three weeks or so, you're going to pick it all up, and you're going to go around the world, literally halfway, halfway around, around the world, the world. To China. Yep. What were your first thoughts when they said, hey, uh, man, guess where we're going to be going in July? China, um, not really a hockey hotspot, but I do have connections over there with the Chinese Olympic Committee and then um, another guy, their strength coach over with the, the Red Stars. So I have some connections in terms of like, hey, what can we do over there, you know, weight room wise and, and all that stuff, and what's, what's accessible to us. But um, I think it's an awesome, um, unbelievable experience for them. Like anytime you can do an international trip and you can do one, one every four years, um, and I think it's going to be an amazing opportunity for them. And also, 
show with all the new freshmen coming in and you know goalie new goalie and it gives the coaches an opportunity to kind of see what they have you know before anybody else so so there's a lot of there's a lot of pros to it a lot of, I wouldn't say cons you know things you're gonna have to deal with you know hey you're going to a new country food what's the food gonna be like over there you know it's, it's a heck of a lot different I went to Taiwan and competed at the world games in Taiwan in the Olympic training village that they had and the food we had frog legs like not really the exact food we wanted to eat but you know so you're gonna have to deal with some different things um, you know, and trying things are different. You know, I went to Mexico with soccer three weeks ago for their international trip. Unbelievable culture experience, cultural experience for them. So I think the same thing's going to be for hockey. It's going to be an unbelievable cultural experience to see the Great Wall of China and to go to different places. A lot of these guys, uh, I've talked to a couple athletes today, they've never been, as Mexico and Canada has been the farthest that they've ever been. Right. Um, so it, it's, it's really a great experience for them. Um, you know, to be able to go over there and play and just see different things and be part of a different culture. All right, so you got to pack everything up and get out there and you got to work up a plan, but you and I talked about this last year about East Coast trips, right? Which is nothing Brutal. compared to this trip, yeah. right? But how do you prepare them to get on an airplane for 13 hours and what, how do you deal with them when they land? That's going to be the hard part of it because you're on a plane, you go from here to I think it's LA and then LA straight over and you're on a plane for 13 hours. So you got to talk about hydration, make sure you're hydrating, make sure that you're eating still while you're on the plane. You got to have to get up and move around so your legs don't swell. So you have to move when you're on a plane. It's different. You take a five hour flight back to Boston and guys are jet lagged and tired from that. Um, this is going to be a whole different story. 13 hour flight and going over. So, you know, it's going to be you know making sure they're hydrated leading up to making sure they're eating well leading up to um, you know dealing with just some some different things you know rhythm of you know when you go to sleep to make sure that when you get over there I, I'm not sure if we get over there in the morning or the night make sure you don't go fall asleep right away um, I'll get them up like on the East Coast trips as soon as we get off the plane if we don't go to um, go practice we'll go straight to the hotel and I'll do a mobility session with them have to get them up moving around and I'll do the same thing there have to get them up moving around because you don't just want them to sit um, it makes it worse too um, and there's some little things they can do you know take some melatonin and, and things like that to help them sleep a little bit um, while while they're on the plane because that's a long that that's a lot of long flight it's a long flight I mean I've done it competing internationally for as long as I have it's you know flying across to Norway flying across to um, we went to Poland last year for World Year two years ago for World Games. So I've been I've been everywhere, and it's it's a lot. Um, I've gone to Taiwan last year. I went to Australia, and so it's a 15 hour flight. Coming back, I think the jet lag is going to be a little bit worse than going there. Yeah. Um, that's what I found. Um, so I think they're I think they're going to struggle. It's going to take them a couple days to adapt to it, um, but I think they'll be okay. You know, doing little tricks of trade. Okay, so the team comes in. We already talked about they, they get physical, they get back on the ice, they, they train to play hockey for a little while, yep. then you fly, then you get there and you've got four or five games in front of yep. the tournament and you're going to do them all in the train about 12 or 13 days and then they're going to come back and they're going to get acclimated back to America, right? and then they're going to go to school, and then they're going to start a second season in September. Your challenges as a strength and conditioning coach for that? Challenges is that it makes it even a longer season. So you have two seasons intermixed, so it's like, hey, we're getting hyped up, we're getting ready for this season, we're gonna play, and then we're gonna come back, and it's like, okay, you gotta have a little bit of a lull, you gotta give them a little bit of time off to rest and recover, not just physically, but mentally, too. Because the season is so long, and the way the schedule is, it, they need to recover, and they need to, it's, it's just as much of a mental break as it is a physical break for them. Um, you know, track and field is kind of the same way. They have an indoor season, and they have an outdoor season, so you're, you're peaking for two different seasons, and that's really what it's going to be and really um, here you're going to be almost three different seasons because you know postseason tournament if they make it postseason tournament you have was it four or five last year we have four weeks off four i think weeks. it said five weeks is going to be this yeah, year you're leaving me to my so, next question so, <laughs> so sorry <laughs> i saw your thunder <laughs> we're going to get there so, okay. so, so anyway my thought is you kind of explained all that part of it get your gut feeling for what it was like for the players and were they at an advantage or disadvantage last April or last March when their season ended on March 2nd, regular season, and they waited four weeks to play a tournament game and then it's a one and done, it's not a weekend series. Yeah. 
I think, you know, there was a little rust on there. They were a little rusty um, from a playing aspect, but they were they were healthy. Yeah. So even though we were healthy all season long, it gave them a physical and a mental break for those three weeks to kind of say, all right, here we go, you know. And um, I think it was a good thing for them. Because I think a lot of teams, you go from your tournament, you know, straight into the NCAA tournament. And you don't, you have no rest, no time off, and you're playing three game series, you know. I mean, it's, it's just different, um, you know, for your, um, your conference tournament. It's really different. I think eventually when they get into a conference, they'll find it um, a little bit harder. But I think I think the four or five weeks off is not a bad thing. Yeah. Um, I do think it was a little bit harder for them to understand getting the rust off from game time and game speed and playing because we can only practice and scrim- practice against each other, scrimmage against each other so much without really, you know, getting the same feeling of playing a true game. So. Well, I'm going to tell and Andrew can speak to this too. Is, um, what I saw was it looked like about a period and maybe five minutes into the second period before they fully had their game, what I call their game yeah. legs, yeah. and then look out, right? And yes. they played really well, and I'm wondering if that, if there's any way to speed that process up. I mean, I was thinking in my head, would it be beneficial to play an ATHA team uh, in between, or would that be too risky with injuries? Or is that even a possibility? Can you do I that? I don't think that's a possibility as far as NCAA rules. So right. you have to follow within the NCAA guidelines and rules. So that's really a compliance question of whether or not that's possible. And I don't think that was possible. And I think that's why they didn't do it. Yeah. So. Okay. Your thoughts, Andrew? Andrew, I just want to ask, you know, last season they played, you know, so many games at the beginning of the year and then the end of the year kind of relaxed up. And we talked about Joey DeCore in this his last season, um, the training for goaltender uh, compared to somebody else. What is that like? And then also on top of that, um, Joey played every game last year. What was it like for you, um, maybe on a day where he's going to the weight room, knowing that you know, he's going to a lot of minutes, or he might, his legs might be a little weary? Kind of that he got a lot of grief from some of the other boys, <laughs> but I did modify him quite a bit. You know, and there was days that I had to, you know, the days that he felt good, he's like, hey, I'm ready to roll. And there was days like, you know what? I think I just need a mobility day, and that's what we did. Um, you know, would, it, would some people say I treated, you know, treated him a little bit differently, a little bit special? But he played every single minute, except for I think seven minutes that you know of a game. So, but I also the same same aspect. Like I kicked Debrow's ass. Like, <laughs> sorry, Debrow, but I, but I did. You know, but he also on the road. Like he wanted to train on the road. Yeah. He's like he's like I'm gonna train on the road because I may or may not get to play. Yeah. So. So Debra was like, I'm on it, I'm training, you know, so so some of those guys, again, they went back to individualization of each, of each of the guys of what they could or could not handle, and if they were a healthy scratch or a scratch, you know, like, we did that all season, and Dax, you know, hey, you know, he, he, he held it, he was just in it for so, so much, and every single minute, like, you had to you had to modify things for him, and you know it's not that he was mentally weak or not tough enough to be able to do workouts like the other guys are doing. He just logged so many minutes that you had to modify things for him. And there, like I said, there was days that he felt great, and we did some circuit-based stu- type stuff. There's some days he wanted to squat and he wanted to do leg work, but there's other days, you know, hey, I'm feeling a little bit banged up in my groin, and you know, hey, understandably so, and you know, we just we went with it. So like I said in the beginning, it's you know. The, you always put a strength coach, you always, a good strength coach, you always put a plan together, a seasonal plan, you know, that, that starts the, the last game of the season and you figure out your whole off season, then you figure out your whole preseason, you figure out your whole in season. But sometimes you just have to go off the script. It's OTS, you gotta go off the script. And that's what we did with some of these guys and I think it worked out phenomenally for them and they stayed healthy and, and I think, you know, knock on wood, that's gonna be the same same thing next year. And, you know, we talk about Coach Powers and the coaching staff and how they are like they're awesome like they they let me do you know what I'm an expert at which is being in the weight room getting guys healthy and strong and and um you know helping them you know I'm not an expert on that's their experts you know as hockey coaches that's not not my forte for me hey what do you need to do what do I need to do with this guy I've like heard, so. I've heard though that you've come in and drawn some face off plays <laughs> <laughs> yeah so um my husband said he's going to teach me how to do a saucer pass. So he's like, I just want you to go out there and do a saucer pass and just freak the guys out. Yeah, so. Absolutely. Yeah, well, then, I appreciate you coming in. I mean, I think we can go on for another two hours and just keep talking this up because it's outstanding stuff. I wish you the best of luck. Take care of the guys on the trip to China. Get them healthy. Get them over there healthy. Get them yep. back healthy. 
Let's get them ready to go and let's get back into the NCAA, NCAA tournament and take another step this season. I'm excited for this whole season. It's awesome. All right, we'll be back to wrap things up in just a minute. Pre-game like a pro, post-game like a champion at College Bar and Grill. Located across the street from the iconic A Mountain and Sun Devil Stadium and a quick walk from Wells Fargo Arena, College Bar and Grill is your home for the best local craft beer, delicious creative cocktails, tasty food, and Tempe's best atmosphere for Arizona State Athletics. College Bar and Grill. Pre-game like a pro, post-game like a champion. Online at ilovecollege.co. All right, hockey fans here in the Desert Southwest. Episode 5 of Hockey Talk in the Desert Southwest. If you're wondering where we were for about 6-7 minutes there, on the live version, um, Leanne has got a lot of great stories, right? I mean, how good is she? I mean, we could talk hockey for like 2 hours, and like... Yeah, definitely, and you know, Leanne, here at Desert the way she speaks, she's so dedicated to her job, and um, just made such an impact just with these guys off the ice and in the weight room, and I think one thing Coach Power has always kind of emphasizes, whether it's a player, a coach, um, even a booster, obviously, you know, those help the team, but uh, one thing that I feel like not only him, but a lot of coaches at ASU have done, and what any really good program, doesn't matter if you're at ASU or any athletic department or team anywhere, uh, you want to be a really good program, a program a top-notch program. You gotta get good players, you gotta get talent, but most of all, you gotta get good people. And you look at the people that Power surrounds himself with, whether it's Coach Hicks or, um, you know, just his assistants that he has on the team. And Leanne, perfect example for them. They're good people and the people that you want to surround, surround yourself with. And I think that's what he's done a really good job of with this program, is just getting people who, you know, are great people and they work really hard and they do all the right things. They don't, they don't take any shortcuts with anything. I think that's the biggest thing is they don't try to get around. I mean, you, I mean, ASU and the hockey program knows that you can't take any shortcuts when you're starting up a Division One team. They took their bumps and bruises, but, um, you know, they got good people. They got the right people. They went through some growing pains, and um, now it's kind of that whole circle that they built around and kind of that small, tight circle that they built around and starting to expand and just get bigger and bigger, and everybody's starting to know about them. So, um, yeah, I think that's the biggest thing is just having that circle, whether it's in the weight room, on the ice, off the ice, and in the community. And I think that's what he's done a really good job of. And Leanne, you know, just showed that, you know, she's a perfect example of it. Well, you know what? I, I came from the University of Minnesota Duluth, right? And the talk about everything around the ASU program is like, oh my God, Coach Powers got the team to the NCAA tournament. Um, when's he going to go coach a pro team? And I'm going like, ah, hold on, man. I don't think that's even in his DNA right now. I don't think he even has a dream of that. Um, not that that wouldn't be a tremendous honor, but he's got Scott Sandlin do that, had an opportunity to interview with Anaheim, and then came back with a nice increase in his salary, which he deserves. But there's some coaches in ho college hockey that they like where they're at. And if they've built a good program and they're winning, they just want to continue to win championships at the college level. Yeah, and I think um, he said it before, but this is his dream job. And I think he said it was after the senior night when they honored, you know, the founding yeah. father, so yep. to speak. And um, he said, there's no place I'd rather be. And, you know, met his wife here, met, had so many great memories of this university. And I'm, you know, I'm trying to think back to the quote that he said, but, um, you know, just had so many great memories of this university and kind of everything that he's gotten through this institution and we talk about Ray Anderson too but just yeah, Ray yeah. Anderson giving him the job and he said you know it's been documented but you know he doesn't want when he you know was applying for the job he said don't give it to him just to give it to him if he wanted to be the guy he didn't mind other people interviewing and he is the guy and he's you know, proven that with um, what he's been able to do with this program and kind of taking them along the way but yeah it's, it's really cool to see and like you said I think he loves it here and I that would be surprising and not that coaching in the NHL um, isn't a tremendous honor like you said but um, you know I think he likes it here a lot like you said before this is his dream job and you start to see the repercussions of someone who's you know putting all his effort into his dream well, I think the challenge from this point forward is going to be how do you maintain that level with players coming in? We talked a little bit off camera about, you know, there's NHL player sons coming here soon. Are they going to come in with an entitlement thing? Are they going to be able to blend with everybody else? How do you take a guy like, uh, you know, uh, an incoming freshman that scored 60 goals? Uh, how does he fit? How, how does his role fit? How does a guy that's gone to play with Team USA, how does that fit? You know what I mean? There's a whole bunch of things that happen when you become successful. And I think that's a whole other side of things. And 
the next couple of years are going to be really interesting. And I think that's where, getting back to my original point, but I think you talk about those things that you just detailed, and I think that's where it goes back to just having a really good circle and trusting the people around you, that trust and um, kind of believing in the people. And one thing Coach Powers has tried to do um, with various players who have gone in the program last couple of years is get high character guys. Kim, yeah, they can score 60 goals tonight, but how are they off the ice? Are they going to represent your program and your community in the right way? And so I think that's one thing they've really done a good job of. You saw it last year, um, and all the guys are really bought into what they're doing right now. But like I said, that goes back to having that circle of people who you trust and just um, believing in, you know, and getting good people to come into your program, whether they're a coach, a player, or whatever their affiliation might be with ASU, and having that pitchfork on their chest. Well, as I said earlier, we've run a little long because that's what tends to happen when you're having a good time, and Hockey Talk has definitely been off to a great start the first five. I'm glad to welcome you back again because you're the returning co-host, right? A returning co-host, the first one. Yeah, I, I, I came back to know the returner. Thank you so much again for having me. It was a blast talking with Leanne. And really, the last two times I've been on, just tremendous guests. I'll, I'll forget about Seth. I know you had Seth on. I'll, I'll give him a hard time for that one. But um, between Lindsay Fry and Leanne, just two you know, amazing women who do so much for, you know, hockey in Arizona and with the man here at ASU and then Lindsay, what you're doing with the Coyotes. It's two tremendous guests and it's been really a blast having me on the show and it's a real honor just to get a chance to, you know, interact and talk with them um, and hear what they go through on a daily basis. So yeah, thank you for having me, Scott. I really appreciate it and I'd love to be back. I'll put it this way. I know somebody's going to be looking for you because you're a talented person and you do uh, writing, you do very good on camera so I know I'm going to lose you eventually at some point but as long as you're hanging around here I'm going to keep bugging you so I'm bringing you on as often as we can so let's wrap things up we got to thank the sponsors our, our good friends at OxyPow our friends at M Drive, and our, our great friends here at College Bar and Grill always a great time to come in because you know what's up next right it's food <laughs> I always have great food we can't come here without eating so uh Get down here, try it out. Get down here for a special night. Tonight's Taco Tuesday. Monday nights are all you can eat wings. Um, there's always something going on. And if nothing else, just come out and hang out next to the campus. It won't be long until we're saying hang out next to the ice arena. Yeah, no kidding. That's the goal down the line. It's going to be exciting to see whenever that new arena comes up this place. I, I feel like every time I drive around the area, I see something new being built up or built, whether it's athletic facilities or building something around here. But, um, yeah, it's getting it's getting crazy, and it's going to be even better when the ice rink gets in town. Well, now that you're an alum, when you come back, every five years to see what's going on here unless we're able to keep you here yeah pretty soon <laughs> pretty soon you know I'm, i just became an alum but five ten years now i'll be the old guy i remember when this was, you know i'll be i'll be the guy recalling the glory days but yeah so it should be fun in the future and it's going to get bigger and better you know with the i feel like with the hockey team around here all right andrew bell thanks for sitting in with us tonight folks tune back in again next week next tuesday night a special site more than likely a special time, too. We'll be back with Hockey Talk in the desert southwest.